Give a round of applause to the FFA.
So what's your 20 year goals? What's your 10 year goals? Five. Think about that. How can you improve? Where do you want to be? And even for me, if I want to go out there, I might end up over here, but at least I'm going forward. You know, you have to go somewhere in order to get there. So what is going to drive you? We don't want more regulations, do we? Now, Ray alluded to 1,900 pounds of phosphorus. That happens to be a field that I picked up to rent. Tested it, 1,900 pounds of phosphorus. We gotta regulate for guys like that. The previous farmer, not good. That, that's, not, that's where regulations have to come in. So we need a few, like, it's a good idea, I think, to have a speed limit. Uh, but then again, we don't wanna be regulated on necessary either. And yes, we have to stand up sometime and, and depend. What we do as agriculture is we're outnumbered. We're, we're a minority when it comes to the general public. So there's place and time for all that. Or, <clears throat> Is the market going to incentivize or require us to do certain practices? Meet your new boss. You can call her a soccer mom, you can call her whatever. She, whether she is right or wrong in what she believes or thinks, will have a certain amount of control over what we do. That's just the reality. Um, I see this as an opportunity because a lot of the things that she likes is what we do in cover crop. When I tell my non-farmers friends, and they ask me what's a cover crop, I simply say, a cover crop helps to keep nitrates out of the Chesapeake Bay. I'm a hero. <laughs> if I have to defend the use of GMOs, it's worthless. I'm not going to do that. I could, I could argue both sides of that, actually. Probably all of us could. It's just, a, you know, you're wasting your time. We have a story to tell, guys and girls. Cover crops, soil health, nutritional density. She loves it. Don't resist some of this stuff you might hear just because you've always done it that way. We have a story to tell. Let's capitalize on what that is. Even if it's just, I'm thinking about growing a cover crop. If that's where you're at, that's great. So, personally, I grow for Whole Foods. I'm a vegetable farmer. I have three acres of high tunnel heirloom tomatoes. And I have, this year I'm gonna have 80 acres of squash and pumpkins. Almost all the pumpkins go to Whole Foods and a, and a portion of the squash. Whole, is there, is, there's probably no Whole Foods growers here, is there? Is there any chance? Well, we have to fill out what they call a responsibly grown uh, um, it's like a questionnaire. And then we get scored points, and each vendor, each grower is ranked by a certain amount of points. Good, better, or best. So depending on the points that we score is how we rank in that. The idea is that Whole Foods can tell their customers, this product here was raised according to a good scale. This is best, and this is better. Now they took that out of the stores now because it created confusion. Because people said, well, why would I even buy the good? Or why don't you carry the best? Some products simply could not obtain that rating. They didn't have it. So they took that out of the stores. They have it internal now. So you heard what I grow. If there's another squash grower knocks on the door of Whole Foods and I'd like your squash for you, they'll say, okay, fine. Um, we'll get a score here. And theoretically, if that person, if that farmer would score higher than me, I may lose the market. May or may not. There's still relationships in this whole thing too, okay? But it's just the tool that they're using. That's what they're doing. So I score very, very, very good. Because you see up there, soil health and um, the insect thing is, is one of the highest scores that you can get. So with my no-till, my cover crops, I'm, I'm in. I'm scoring really good. Um, so, so that's that's good for me. I get rewarded. I don't get a price premium, but to be fair, Whole Foods pays well. When you go to Whole Foods, you pay well. That's who I want to sell to. As a farmer, <laughs> that's why I don't sell to Walmart. That's the cheap stuff. Anyway, I also grow for Blue Apron. Question? Do you have to go through a co-op to sell the Whole Foods? No. Thing? No. You don't have to get through a co-op to sell to Whole Foods, but you have to take this and you have to get through this. That's required. And, and then you have to be, you know, 
approved. And it's, it's it, it, it took me 20 hours. So those of you guys who think that us vegetable growers are making big money, <laughs> we are sometimes, yeah. But it's a whole different ballgame of marketing. You know, you gotta know it takes time. Take time to pull this stuff off. But you do not have to have a cut off. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. But no, you can go in. I, I happen to have joined up with another farmer to sell Whole Foods, but you don't have to. How many of you heard of Blue Apron, a meal kit delivery service where you can order the basically ingredients and then they give you a recipe and put it together? I started selling to them in 2017 last year. And what I found interesting was they gave us a questionnaire too, but it wasn't to score in any way. They just wanted a baseline. They just wanted where are our growers at? Where are they at? And then they wanted to do something with it later. Well, if you follow any kind of news lately, Blue Apron's in financial troubles, partly because there's so many knockoffs now. Other types of meal kit delivery has hit them hard. The other thing is Amazon.com happened to buy out Whole Foods. And the second I heard that, I thought, oh, Amazon's good in logistics. Whole Foods has food. They're going to compete with Blue Apron, and they are. And that's, again, just as an aside. What I love, though, about Blue Apron, if you look close in here, you'll see one of the questions is, what percentage of the year are living roots in your soil? I couldn't believe it when I saw that. I thought, that is incredible. That's a great question. And I'll just say, to Blue Apron's credit, they sent out two individuals to look at my farm to basically, I wouldn't say verify what I said on here was true, but basically to understand how I grow things. And I thought that, now that is backing up. If you buy from anybody, people make all these claims about where they source their food, and sometimes it's just based on hearsay or filling out a form. Blue Apron came to my farm and looked at what I did and verified it. I appreciated that uh, as a farmer. And I'll just say the Whole Foods never did that. They just, you know, and I'm, I'm just, just saying that's some of the behind the scenes stuff that you'll never see. Oh, this might affect you a little differently. Wrangler jeans, probably all heard of them. They have a brand new slogan called Tough Denim, Gentle Footprint. Guess what? They're trying to encourage their cotton growers to grow cover crops and soil health principles so they can market to the general public. That is, everyone's trying to out-sustainable one another or out-whatever one another. I'm all set for that, and I don't grow cotton. But the nice thing is, I'm going down to Brando's headquarters in Greensboro, North Carolina, where you used to live, mm -hmm. and I'll be down there in, in well, it's less than a month now. They're going to have a field day and a, a thing where they're inviting people in to talk about cover crops. Brando jeans. I asked them, where are you going to go with this? Are you going to incentivize farmers to do this? And say, hey, if you grow cotton with cover crops, we'll pay you a couple cents an hour a pound, or are you going to require it? He said, well, we're still working out the details. So I don't know, but that's happening. So will it come to milk? Will it come to corn? Probably. Probably. And that's why I'm telling you this today. You might want to start sticking, picking it up a notch or two, right? You might want to do that because there might be some benefits and some incentives here. Ray said this before, I'll ask it again. What's your most important cover crop tool? Shovel. You're going to take that step further. It's your mindset. How you think about cover crops. What your attitude is. And maybe the last, their willingness to strategically try a new concept. To strategically, I was talking to you, I didn't get your name, I was talking to him out in the hallway there a little bit. You know, this guy here is trying some things. He's asking me what I thought. I'm not, I said, keep, keep trying. Keep messing around with stuff. Um, see what works. Take care of it. I showed you a dust storm from Kansas. This is Lancaster County. Family reunion Sunday afternoon, first week of January. Remember that was really, really cold. We had a little snow and it blew for three days. You probably had it up here too. And it blew down. It actually dried the frozen soil out and was blowing dirt. We call that snurt. <coughs> snow and dirt. Snurt. I told my wife, man, we gotta collect that. I gotta collect it. 
you have anything in the back of the Suburban? Yeah, I got a plastic uh, pin back here, so I dumped her stuff out. Got out, collected this snurt, took it home, melted it down, got a soil sample of it. And that's not a bad looking soil sample there, right? Um, I mean, how many of you would like that kind of soil? Well, I brought it along with me today. If you guys want to look at this, you can. This is some I didn't test. Nice, fine, good Lancaster County soil. I said, I ought to get back here and test that field that came from. Just to see. About a month later, things pulled out. I trespassed from the farmer's field that I didn't know who it was. <coughs> Collected a soil sample. And it was higher in every element that blew. See the pattern? It's the same field. Higher in every element than sulfur. Sulfur was the only one that wasn't quite as high. The best soil blew. Doesn't happen much in Pennsylvania, but the same thing happens when you lose it with water. And you can lose soil under no-till conditions. Especially in the spring when it falls out, starts falling out, the ground's not totally, can't infiltrate very good at that point. We can lose soil. So just saying, it's always your best soil that leaves. That's why you want to keep it there. So we drove home. I told my wife, we better stop at our farm to see how it looks. And so this is how it looked at our place. It is white. And you can see, Lancaster County has a lot of cover crops. And it was interesting driving around. Snurt, clean snow. Snurt, clean snow. You can just see it. Um, so depending on the fuel. Now, just last week, this was circling around Twitter. That's in England. Same problem. I asked the question, do cover crops pay? Just saying. <laughs> you know, this, is, this doesn't need to be. Uh, extreme example. So, just thinking back, a lot of times, those of us who might, those of you who may be new, as soon as you have one little negative thing with cover crops, you're going to blame the cover crops. I say, did we ever blame the plow for crusting, for infiltration, erosion? That's what caused it, but because we used the plow so much, we never really blamed the plow. I'm just saying, Think about it the same way. Don't blame cover crops so much that they're the culprit. Probably your management. Remember I used that word a lot at the beginning today? Management is what makes the difference here. And again, the fertilizer that we pay for, if we can keep it on our fields. When we keep it on our fields, that's money in our pocket. That's another way that cover crops will pay. You may not see it in the ledger book, but you know it's happening. Either we lose it through groundwater or it runs off. And you know, if we have a leak in the farm in our hydrant, we're gonna fix it. Because even water, which is very, 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 very cheap, we see that as a waste. We're good enough stewards that we don't like that. How much do you feel when you're losing nitrates? I know you can't see it, but you know it. You guys are farmers, you know it's out there. So think about this. If we're just growing corn silage, we're only having living roots in the soil three, four months out of the year. Um, but cover crops, we can grow things that a lot of you never thought you could grow. When I first started to start growing sunflowers, you wouldn't believe them, any neighbors called me up and just say, I think, do you mind if we get a few of your sunflowers? No problem. Now that doesn't pay the bills, but it gives me a lot of goodwill. Because now I'm perceived as a good farmer. There's no soil running off my farm out in the road. But, you know, again, this is just, I, I say this whole thing makes farming fun again. Now, those of you who are, who are like down the road and cover crops, how many of you agree to that? This cover crop makes the thing makes farming. Okay, some of you probably say it makes it frustrating, and I get that. But you get into this five, ten years, you'll say it makes it fun again. So, really, what we're trying to do is basically collect sunshine. And sunshine turns into carbon, liquid carbon. If you don't have plants growing in your soil, the sun's being wasted. And as Ray said, it's heating up the soil in the summer and, and going back, it's heat, not good for the climate. So that's, again, is why we want to not waste the opportunity that we have here. So we need to look at soil building as more of a generational thing. Typically, we think of it as seasonal. Is they, they gonna pay this year? 
Now it's an investment for that 10, 20 years that I talked to you about before. So a few, again, I'm going to show you a few more data slides here to kind of back up what I've said, and I, I encourage you to do your informed research where you can. This area was an example where I had 12 years of where I planted tomatoes in a high tunnel. It was time to move the high tunnel. So I said, well, I'm going to do a cover crop plot in there. 12 years of basically run down soil, we'll say. So I looked at zero nitrogen, um, 50 pounds and 100 and 150 pounds of nitrogen. The red bars are where I had planted cover crops, and the blue is no. So you can see the advantage up there up till that time there we, we got the 100 pounds of nitrogen. The extra nitrogen really didn't, I didn't really need it in this case. Again, it's a cover crop effect. Now here's another one here that I felt was really insightful. I went four years straight where I applied zero nitrogen in a corn, bean, wheat, corn rotation. I just wanted to see. It was only a half an acre. I just wanted to see what would happen. Now I'll tell you, in that, the, 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 the one I got hit the most on was wheat. I lost 20 bushel of wheat, but not put any nitrogen. And, and it just that's just the way that worked out. But when you look across the bottom there and see after four years planting corn, where there was no cover crop, 101 bushel, where we had cover crop with no nitrogen, 128. That's 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 26, 27 bushels that I got from the cover crops. Essentially, the cover crop gave me that bushel. So if you want some numbers, there's some numbers. Um, added 75 pounds of nitrogen, probably yields up to probably what we needed to. So again. By, that's the kind of stuff that has caused me to be firmly committed. I, I know it works. You can't pay me not to plant cover crops. I said that this morning, just say it again. It's diversity, diversity, diversity. And that could be included in your cash crops. See, the soil doesn't know if it's a cash crop or it's a cover crop. The soil doesn't know that. But it wants diversity. So if you can grow four or five different things in a rotation, that's great. But the nice thing about cover crops is we can mix those species up and plant them together and get enhance our diversity. Diversity on steroids, if you want to think of it that way. And then having living roots year-round. This is how we can get these nutrient benefits. And by keeping our soil covered, but that bottom point there, the length of time that we are in this system, the longer it is, the better it gets. And that's the hard part. Because our culture doesn't promote patience a lot. We want everything instantly. We're used to buying nitrogen and putting it out there and seeing an effect within a week. And that's what we're used to. Or herbicides or whatever. We want to see instant results. And that's why it's tough for us sometimes. So the longer you're into this system, the less fertilizer you're going to need. When I say longer, that may be 5, 10, 20 years. I've been really into this pretty intensively for the last 15, 20 years, I'm still seeing improvements. I don't know when it will stop. I don't think anybody does yet. I don't think anybody has reached a plateau, to, to my knowledge. Um, so here's another take home point, to, to, to say this another way. Using cover crops long term makes fertilizer more efficient. Uh, you know, that's just, that's just something that, I, that, I, that I've seen in that. Another example here, and this is the magic of mixes mixed species. Planted after wheat, and I would really encourage some of you to think about getting some small grains in your rotation. I was talking to some people at lunch. Um, on your poor ground, those of you who are doing corn silage and stuff for corn for cow's feed, might want to consider using sort of sand grass. Um, on your poor ground, and taking it off a little earlier, and then getting a chance to get a multi-mixed mix species planted for the fall. So um, so when you can get that out there, that's when things really get ramped up quick. See, I like to say it doesn't have to take 25 years to reach this like it might have took me for some things. We've learned so much. I know I could do it a lot quicker now if I would have known back then what I know now. So here's again another decent corn year. After that mix I just showed you, uh, 190 bushel with zero in, my maximum yield came at just 60 units of N, side rest. 
That's all I needed. Typically, I would probably put 150 on there. So I saved that. And now, now I'm becoming more comfortable with that. Now, if I plant corn, uh, I'm going to show you a slide here soon, in the cereal aisle at six feet tall, I, I need more than 60 units in that reason that. Because the rye is taking a lot of it up and it takes a while to release it. So these numbers all are affected by the type of cover crop, the C to N ratio of the cover crop, how it breaks down. All that gets into its effect. So I would really encourage you, those of you who can, to do your own replicated strip checks with varying fertilizer rates. And, and just to see where it comes out on your farm. Because what I did here probably won't be replicated and come out with the same numbers. If I would have done the exact same things 20 years ago, I guarantee you the numbers would be different. So I don't know where you're at in your journey. So that's why you need to do your own testing. And those, those who have GPS and guidance and stuff like that, yield monitors, not that hard. Not that hard to do. So here's an instance where I know that if I plant a good mixed species cover, I don't need any nitrogen fertilizer till later. And there are times when I can grow corn without nitrogen. But that doesn't happen all the time. With my vegetables and everything, some of them I squash, they'll do off till almost the end of October, like you guys with corn and stuff. And I, I'm trying to work with uh, interseeding cover crops into squash and stuff, and it's haven't figured that out totally yet, but working on it. So I'm, I'm pushing the envelope wherever I can. But this is some of the rewards that you get. This is my cultivation season right here. These are my cultivators, my micro herd. Uh, 36 earthworms in a square yard. When you see that in your own fields, that becomes you're a your believer. So he says it's 60 ton of worm castings. I did not know that. Thank you. Good to know. Sounds pretty good. Yep. So, and uh, I'll just put a picture to basically support what Rage is saying. If you can get animals, or if you have the remotest thought that you may think about getting animals, I would take that to the next level. I told my son, um, you know, I'm not an animal guy. I'm interested in it. He's not really either. I said he needs to marry a girl who likes animals <laughs> so we can get animals on our farm. So we'll see how that works out. But uh, I don't know. We're, we're thinking about it. I'm just telling you. So one of the strongest questions you can ask yourself, if you're trying to put the pieces together here, what you should do, identify what you're trying to accomplish. Is it erosion control? Is it nutrient efficiency? What is it? It can be a whole host of things. What are you specifically trying to accomplish? Maybe five different things. I don't know. Once you identify that, look at your planting window. And if you don't have that planting window to, to, to plant what you want, can you make that planting window? You know, we talked about interseeding. I mean, that's an option. I don't know. Um, so, again, I said rearrange the picture. You might have to rearrange the picture a little bit. Our cover crops can give a benefit of weed control, and, and that's something that maybe what you're trying to accomplish. Radishes are really good to that, but if you plan on time, sure to rise good at that. Fast growing cover crops are good at that. I don't know um, how many of you probably wouldn't want to wait till your rise is high to plant up here. It's getting a little late, I get that. It's a farmer friend from Franklin County, Southern PA. He's growing his rye to suck out the moisture. But then also to keep the moisture in August when it gets hot and dry. Saving some herbicides here. This is what I like to say technology and biology have merged in the 21st century. High tech stuff, but we're using biology to save in our inputs and to grow a better crop. And here, just to close up with how those rollers are, you can get to put in the planter. Okay, challenges. I have challenges. I like spoke type closing wheels. I'm able to get my thick root thatch closed where I have my living cover crops. It's nicer to do that. But when the cover crops get to be taller than three feet, they can start wrapping. And it's real, I really hate it when you get to the end, you look back and you see one row where the, where the wheel stop turning and it's dragging. And the corn seeds, you can see them laying there because they're not being covered. Yeah, I'll show you pictures. This is rolled, actually, coming up. So I had to get to the point where it was one of my, when I was doing this, it was one of my rented fields. No, one of our fields is my land. I had to drive it and get the air wrench out, take all the, all the closing wheels off, 
get that out because it was too tight. It was literally hot. I mean, it was so hot for them, you know, until they lock up. But you know, there's there's solutions to some of these problems. You don't give up. I never give up. And there, I've been playing around with different deflectors. Getter. This is a deflector from Getter. So if you have spoke closing wheels and you uh, you know growing into going into tall covers, here's a tool now that you can buy to solve that problem. It's just like your battery operated fencers, the tool, or your the, the latches. This whole planting green thing, I'm frankly surprised how fast it's sweeping the nation. Even in Iowa, and Illinois even. I couldn't believe it. Everywhere. I mean, guys are interested in this whole planting green. And I'll just tell you, going into soybeans is very easy. Going into corn is difficult. You gotta know your stuff. You gotta put some more nitrogen up front, uh, is, is the big thing. And corn, you need to have it down. Soybeans, can, it doesn't all have to be rolled down. Much more forgiving in so many ways. But here's how I do it some years. Not every year, but this is how I do it all the time for my pumpkins. I'm not going to talk about that today, but I leave my covers grow tall. This happens to be uh, where I had cereal rye, a little bit of vegetables in there. Rolled it down, planted my corn into that. This was two years ago when we were wet too in May. I didn't finish planting corn in the last week of May. And at that stage, now it finally warmed up. I keep my road cleaners up. I don't need to clean a row off to warm anything up. No need for that. I don't want to see the field was planted. When I leave the field, I don't want you to know it's planted. I don't want you to see the rotors. But I got all my seeds down in there. And when you have this kind of cover, it gives you some weed control. And I went in there and I, uh, I like I said, I rolled it down. And I did use some herbicide to finish it off, like, uh, like a, just a half a quart of glyphosate to finish it off. Came back in there, corn grew nice. This was 15 inch corn, this is for silage. Grow it for a neighbor. And I only needed to use post emergence around the bottom uh, swath because that's some burnt cucumber coming. You have burnt cucumber up this far? Oh boy, you don't want that. And it was too much to keep after with the hose, so, so I, I sprayed the bottom 40 foot. That's all I sprayed in that field other than, than like $3 worth of right flight to save. Grow a beautiful field of corn, no residuals. Came back next year, planted it back into corn, and silage off, so put a cover top in. This time I got some crimson clover in, put 80 pounds of anon, 27 bushels, uh, 27 tons of silage came off that field, and the one end toward the woods had a lot of deer damage. So that wasn't a bad yield. Five dollars worth of herbicide again, just burned down, and I have it's still the same field. I had to go around the bottom and clean up my poor bird cucumber. I'm just being honest with you. My goal, my goal, is to eliminate residual herbicides. That's where I'm at. And I have been able to go with no herbicides in some areas, sometimes, some years. So I like to say a little bit of herbicide goes a long way with rolling big cover crops. It's the same thing applies to my um, to my pumpkins and squash. They're all no-till. Um, so maybe this is going to push you a little bit here, but I started doing what they call companion cropping, growing multiple species of cash crops together and harvesting them together. Now I'm up to three. If you look close, I just took this picture last week. It's a little rough because uh, just coming out of winter, starting to wake up there. Winter peas, hairy veg, and, and um, oil seed radish. Oil seed radish is a contract with Purdue for high uricic acid, special variety they have. Hairy veg and winter peas is going to be a cover crop. More than I can use, I'm going to sell it. So I have three cash crops coming out of there. They're going to be harvested together. I can separate it because the seed sizes are enough to part. I can separate them all with the seed. No nitrogen needed for my oil seed rake, which you normally would need, because my lagoon is providing nitrogen for it. No herbicides needed because we have a thick cover. I'm going to, last year I did it, and, and it, it made me money, I was just saying. So this is, this is where I'm at in doing some of this kind of stuff here. I'm sure you have resistant weeds up here, right? Mare's tail? Got resistant mare's tail? The, remember I told you about that two acre plot of um, what was my high tunnel tomatoes? I showed you some research on that earlier on. Well, I, what I did in that field is I kept some out of cover crops. And 
where the rows were that were in cover crops for the last five years, on the left side there, zero mare's tail. And not a lot, but every single plot of no cover crops, mare's tail. Cover crops can help. This is becoming so much consistent that in the Midwest, through the Corn Belt, there are farmers growing cover crops now just for this aspect of cover crops. It's a method to control resistant weeds. Isn't that something? I think that's just interesting. That that's, that's actually, that it's consistent enough, especially when working with ground and crops, that especially cereal rye in soybeans is the key. That's the most popular one where they're actually keeping those resistant weeds down. Any other questions? Well, in this case, picture here, it happened to be, there's a mix in there. It's not just cereal rye. There's hairy vets and crimson clover and Western European. There was radishes and oats. I always, if I don't have five or six species, I'm looking for something to throw in, you know. So, so in this case, that was that. So as far as seeding rates, I will tell you, if you're going after weed control, you, you want to keep your seeding rates maybe a little higher. Um, like, you know, with, with, if you're used to just planting 40, 50 pounds of rye, which is great for cover crop, you might want to bump it up to a bushel, bushel land, depending on your plant. And part of it is, is just a sheer, it, it, it just keeps it from growing. Um, so, another thing I just want to tease you a little bit where the future is going is some of the technology. This is a planter from Canada um, that has been, been working on for a couple years. But the cool thing about it is they can plant six different species of either patch crops or cover crops and adjust it, all the six on the go as they plant. So now, uh, and it's going to take some. That was the use that sucker cost. I don't want to know. I'm sure uh, as much as more than the house. But it's a, the, the reason I'm telling you is now we are getting, and this is why I love this time of life, technology and biology. Now, if you get a field map, like this, this, say this is your soil type, this is some measurement of soil. I'm just saying this is a little bit futuristic, but we can maybe match our cover crop mixes according to a certain thing we're trying to fix in soil. That's what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not the answer to it. But here's a great thing. This is a picture I took when I was in Hungary. I never saw such a dramatic difference in one field. This was a cover crop of mustard, which is a relatively poor cover crop, by the way. But that's what they were using. And that is simply a soil type showing up there, how well the mustard grew. Obviously, that one part of the field should have had uh, something else. Now, I would say, the, the first thing to do is plant a four or five way mix in there. Because you don't know where, what part of the field a certain species will be most helpful. All our fields have variability, and that's another fault for mixes. It's just like precision agriculture is mixes. Yes? Let me tell you, real, why Steve said that's so important. Dave Brandt, I drove eight hours, he was in a really bad mode, and an Austrian wheat and PA radish. Very heavy clay soil, it was wet, both died. Austrian winter pea and the radish died. It was first year no to. And I said, I got out of the car, you could tell he was in a really busy mood. I said, David, he asked me, well, what happened, right? It's ex exactly what you saw there. I said, David, why didn't you plant five or six or seven species? He said, what do you mean? I said, David, nature never puts just one or two seeds. It's got six or seven. It's called resilience. Something will survive that condition. Exactly what Steve is telling you. If you put one species, now if you put seven species and you've got three to survive, you're not in such a bad mood. But if you plant two or three and get nothing, you're in a bad mood. Watch what nature does. She never puts her eggs just in one basket. She's exactly right. One so time, one fall, I took a six-way mix and intentionally planted it every week over a four-week period. By the time November rolled around, you would have thought the mix was different at every planting, but it was not. It looked different. Now, it was during September, so that's a critical time. But it was very interesting to me, when you looked at that mix, I mean, you see the ones a little higher, but when you looked at the species, they looked different. And that was a sheer timing thing. So that's, that's again, a plug for mixes. How many of you have 15-inch soybean planters? Or, okay, not many, okay. I'm gonna blow through this. There's, there's more and more people 
of getting you know more narrow beam planners and so forth. And there's a, there's a reason why you can use some of these precision planners. Uh, we don't use them very much during the year. Usually use them for the spring, but why not bring them out in the fall to plant cover crops? Sometimes they're wider. I didn't take this picture wasn't taken in northern Pennsylvania, but uh, we got wide equipment these days. So I'll just blow through here, but I wanted to show you this. You know, we can start singulating radish seed and cut the rate in half. It's a money saver. Uh, cover crops have come down in price by and large lately, but still, you know, we're looking to shave dollars off per acre. You can bring use your planter for this kind of stuff. That's great. Um, Kinsey brush meters are um, <clears throat> made by Kinsey. Very simple meter. You can use that to plant mixed cover crop seeds. I just found out last week, this is the first major manufacturer I know of. Kinsey is now going to be making cover crop plates. Kinsey is. Now up until that time, you've had aftermarket people making them. Here's one seed right here. If you have a Kinsey or John Deere plant or precision planting units, you can buy now cover crop plates to plant annual ryegrass with your corn plant. You can do it now. It's out there. And white, and in the case of an ash was coming up in a year or two. But Kinsey just announced they are actually having their own plate. I immediately contacted Kinsey. I said, hey, do you have any pictures or literature? And they said, no, we just made the press release. We don't have anything yet, but it's going to be available for this fall. So I think that's pretty cool that, that that's coming out there. Now, here's something I really like. It's a problem sometimes closing the slot, the seed slot. Common problem when we're planting green, you have a thick root thatch down there of growing cover crops. And the reason it's a problem, and this is why a lot of people like spoke type closing wheels, but it's a little easier to close the slot. This is from France. This is a planter in France where you can adjust the toe in exactly what you need for a given situation. And you can close the slot with very little down measure. Again, technology now coming to serve us. Uh, I want to just say about short season corn, it was mentioned here. Uh, I'm in Lancaster County, full season corn is 107 a day. I'm planting now 93 and 89 day corn. And I'm sure some of you guys are planting longer than that up here, right? I don't know. Are you? What's your corn days? 107. So there's some good 89 day varieties out there, 93 day varieties. Even you can harvest maybe two weeks here to get that cover crop planted. And I did testing for quite a few years on my farm. And um, yeah, it didn't beat the long term. Uh, the shortest season stuff, I lost nine bushel, if you want to look at it that way, on a three year average, replicated. This is scientific, by the way. This isn't side by side, you know. This is way to the way back. This is good, good data. Um, but what was key is whenever I took this data, whenever I harvested, I always harvested 20, 21% grain. I always planted the cover crop the same day or the next day in those plots as they came off over a one month period. When cover crops were planted sooner, came back next year, planted one hybrid across those former plots, I, I got back my yield. I uh, got back my yield because I planted cover crops two weeks sooner in the fall, so the following year, just because I did that. Everything else being equal, fertilizer, everything, I got it back. So it's a management way to get your corn in. And some of you that are selling grain and stuff, there were some days I was shelling corn, I was the only guy going into the grain elevator. There was no one else shelling in the area. And I was getting my cover crops planted. And uh, this works even soybeans too. And there was a big move across Pennsylvania to plant shorter beans. I mean, our area, full season beans are three nine, four ones. We're planting two sevens, two eights now. Getting them all from the middle of September, first week of September sometimes, planting cover crops. That is not hard to do, guys. I don't know where you're at up here. I tested beans down to 1.7, 1.5 even. It really fell off when I got into ones in my area. So you find the wall sometimes. But I had some really good 2.2 beans. I got 71 bushels once on 2.2 beans. Unbelievable. So not every short season bean is good. you got to sift through. There's some genetics out there nowadays that can really serve us well as we think about the management in this. So this is, this is what I'm talking about. That's corn, September the 11th, harvested early corn. I'm planting cover crops with my precision planter with special plates in there. I'm planting cover crops. Look how nice that looks. Right down between the rows, all GPS and everything. I got all that stuff. 
uh, this is to me, you know, where, where I'm at. And then by the end, middle of November, my fields are green. Because, you know, you know, because I took it to management. Managed to get that done. Um, I know there's not a lot of you guys who are small green. I've encouraged you guys to think about it. Somehow, small green, I guess some service in the end or something. Try to get your field, in the next five years, your field, sometime, at least one field with a good multi-species cover crop in the summer that will look like this. Okay, Farm, farmer friend, Lancaster County, north of me, good soil, has chicken manure. He planted corn after that, the next year, 278 bushels, 273 bushels, no nitrogen. He added 70 pounds and picked up 4.5 bushels. Good soil, good cover crop, no nitrogen needed. Was it manure? Yes. No, not in this case. It was pre previous. He didn't have manure uh, here. But he has a history of manure, and you need to know that, to be fair. This is good soil. Wild fertile soil. Just so, just so you know that. Cover crops make fertilizer more efficient. The secret, guys, to make this work is learn how to make your spur of the moment on site decisions. It's the nuances, and that's why Ray says it would take three days or more for us to go over everything. We're trying to, that's why this conference today was more about teaching you how to fish rather than giving you fish. Every one of you wanted to come here and get a prescription um, how to do in your farm. And I have something I'm going to have we can hand out here then but, uh, uh, to help you with these thoughts I have. But you need to be able to also you know, try things, understand not everything's going to work. And I um, wanted to show you my failures. I had two acres I had to replant because of slugs. I've never had slug problems until this year, but I violated some of my own principles. Corn on corn and winter killed cover crops. That's where I had slugs. I still had some, that was, that was, that was devastating, I'll say. I still had some slugs where I planted greening, but it wasn't an issue. No yield effect, no loss. So I went in and replanted two acres. I thought, I'm going to throw some sun hemp in there. Just, just see what happens. Well, the sun hemp grows faster than corn. At harvest time, it's, 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 as much as I know how to run a combine, I could not get that head speed time right not to shear that sun hemp. Well, that sun hemp just cut off, no matter how, how fast I ran ahead. So I ended up those two acres harvesting one row at a time. Make your mistakes small, okay? So, you know, you're, I'm pushing the limit, I know, but that's how I learn. I should have just turned that out. You should just do that. That's a good idea. See, there you go. I'm not quite, see, I'm not there yet. But I'm headed there. Talk to your landlords. I'm hearing more and more landlords now. Well, I'll put it this way. Landlords can be dug in and say, no, I want, I want you to grow it. I don't like cover crops for a reason. Well, a lot of times you explain what they do. You're protecting their investment. You're increasing the value of their investment. And a lot of times they are convincible. Sometimes to the point they will actually help you and pay you for cover crops. Some will. I'm actually hearing now of some landlords demanding their tenants to plant cover crops. And some tenants are coming to the NRCS, I just heard this, and say, we're going to plant them cover crops. Can you help us? Great. One way or the other. So talk to your landlords. Speaking of landowners, I had five landowners in the last year come to me, total of 95 acres, asking me to farm their land. Now, I've been doing this for, I started no-till in 82. It's the first time I ever had anybody come to me. And it happened five separate ones in one year. That, you know, to me was very rewarding. Basically, what they said is, I want you to take care of them. They've seen what I've done, and so forth, so they wound up. So, um, a little plug here for the Pennsylvania No-Till Alliance. They have these signs that you can put up. So the general public knows what a cover crop is, talk about water quality, talk about soil health, uh, and so forth. And don't farm naked. <laughs> That's not good. Uh, plant cover crops. And if you do this right, and everything comes together, you will have successes eventually. 
Just get ready for those big yields that you want. <laughs> I mean, you got to be ready. Sometimes it'll surprise you. Uh, I'm telling you, this surprised this guy so much that he had some pretty high yield losses in that acre. That's not good. Um, <laughs> One person asked me. One person actually asked me once. Do you think he was texting? <laughs> I said I don't know. Anyway, so I believe cover crops will, will pay. But the key is that they're strategically planned for, with long-term objectives clearly in mind. That's the secret here. So as I mentioned, I have a, uh, a brochure or a piece of paper. There were some in the back there. There's some here. If you want to give each row some. It's the 10 different things, and my encouragement is take your game up 10%. If it's your first 10%, awesome. If you're at 100% now, well, improve it, your system, by 10% then. I think 10% is a nice number to try, guys. I want you to go out of your thing. What's the 10% that you can do? So, hey, I appreciate your time today. Appreciate you having us here, inviting us. And um, we'll stick around for a while, Gray and I. And, um, yeah, all the best. Thanks. Thing that applies here that these guys have said applies to gardens too. We have people raise their hand on how many people do gardens. I'm trying to do that with my own garden, so it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that works. But all the same principles work. Let me, let me just give you a quick plug. If you do a garden, go to YouTube and type lasagna gardens. It's a no-till garden. You don't have to till. And you do layers of residue. They work fantastic. It's called lasagna garden. No-till gardens, and there's another one called Hugo Culture. <coughs> they work fantastic. Back to Eden. Back to Eden. Go to their website. Those gardens work fantastic. No weeds. You don't have to work so hard. Lasagna Garden. <coughs> They're on YouTube. Excellent. You can get books on it. And the other one's called Hugo Culture. Anybody know how to spell Hugo Culture? I don't know. Let me spell it. H-U-M-L-G-E-L. Say it again. Hugo. 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 Spell it. They look it up because it worked. These gardens work fantastic. It's H-U, but the German has two dots above it, which mm -hmm. means you pronounce it U. Mm. U. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And Hugo. 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 It's like a mountain. It's a hill. It's a hill. It means hill. H-U-G-E-L. Work fantastic. The wood chips and that. One of the best gardens you can grow. And for anybody that is in the gardens, we're going to have a workshop in May. We've got a local guy that kind of does all this already. So we're going to have him come in, and, uh, or we're going to go to his place probably, and, uh, and, do, and look at some of that because it's pretty, pretty powerful. Um, they just mentioned I, I, was, I was scouting some fields for a guy one time, and the landlord actually called me and said uh, the exact opposite because he didn't understand. He's like, I like these nice clean fields over here that have been tilled and there's nothing left, and yada, yada, yada. This guy over here, you know, all the corn stubbles left, they're ugly. There, there's a concept out there that cover crops are ugly, right? I, I convinced a teacher to do a garden no-till. And I'm going to make this really short because you guys want to get going. She thought it was ugly. It was the best garden she ever had. She put a pound later mix there, harvested stuff she's never harvested before. It was great. But it was ugly because we have this concept in our mind that we want rows of corn and nothing in between them. Right? And the minute you put something in between them, it's ugly. Okay? Which leads me to one more point is a weed. What's a weed? Okay? We had, we had a field last year that we sprayed Roundup on. I believe, anyway, correct me if I'm wrong back there, but sprayed Roundup on an alfalfa field, no-tilled into it, because alfalfa can sometimes be hard to kill. The corn started growing, the alfalfa come in. The alfalfa got to be, I don't know, almost knee high in there. We finally go back in and kill it. But we had over 200 bushel acre to the acre of corn which is pretty good for around here. Um, you'd have thought with that weed in there, it would have put some pressure on that and taken some off. I don't even know if we had to kill it. Is it legume? It was feeding the rest of the corn nitrogen. You know, it wasn't taking much water away from it because we had enough water. I, I don't know. I just, I think we have to reevaluate what a weed is. You know, the chemical companies want us again to have a rows of corn and nothing in between. And if that weed isn't competing for sunshine, it's maybe not competing for moisture, correct me if I'm wrong here and stuff, but I think we just need to reevaluate what a weed is. We don't need to necessarily make it look like this floor right here. Got another plug-in. There's a book you want to get. It's free. It's called Guardians of the Soil. <coughs> I, can't, I can't remember the professor. One of the best weed books ever. 
It talks about what weeds do for the soil. It changes the whole view of weeds called, called guardians of the soil. It's free. Just Google it and PDF. It'll come up. It's an excellent book.